Hey everyone, welcome back to the Commercial Real Estate Library. I'm Dama Tamanawala. You know my co-host Garrett McGillivray, and today we're joined by the CEO of Candorel, Brett Miller. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Nice to be part of your podcast. Love it. Yeah. Um, just to dive into it, could you just give us a brief background of sort of your your history, your career history, and sort of where you were from and how you got to where you are now? Okay. How much time do you have? <laughs> no, this one you can be maybe <laughs> like. Yeah. I'll, I'll run through it very quickly. Um, so I, I was fortunate when I was when I was 15, 16 years old. I decided what I wanted to do in life. And most teenagers uh, have no idea if they want to be a doctor, lawyer, or a construction worker. And uh, the real estate fascinated me, uh, partly because my family was involved in real estate. Yes. And, uh, right up to you. And um, secondly, I just find that you know the, the, the mix of the creative part of real estate, the, the marketing side, the impact it has on communities, and then the finance side just uh, rang a bell with me. And so uh, I went to McGill University, uh, did a, a focus, a concentration, a BCom, but specifically in real estate and in finance. And uh, it was actually through a, uh, a visiting professor I got an introduction to my first job, which was started off as a summer job, but it was at Canderell. Right. And if we fast forward, that's where I am now. But there was a, there was a period I'll talk to you about where I wasn't. Right. Um, and so uh, how I, old, I, how I, old was the company? At the that company time. was started in uh, 75, so this was okay. 86, so it was still a you know, yeah, dozen right. years old, yep. run by John Wiener, who at the time was, uh, when he hired me, probably an old man. He was 36. <laughs> 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 but uh, I, I was extremely fortunate but for a few, few reasons. One, uh, John Wiener believed in youth. Uh, in fact, that's still uh, what we do in the company today is we give young people a lot of responsibility. So... I was 25 years old and running a major development project, and I thought I'd kind of gone to heaven. Um, and so uh, I had a, an internship through the company doing uh, uh, the, the, the analyst work. That's how most people start. Then on the leasing side and then on the development side. And uh, that was in a time when the real estate world was exploding. So um, with a bit, perhaps a bit more speculation than there is today, it was perhaps un unhealthy in the way it was growing. But uh, from 86 to 1990, uh, real estate was like the, the tech boom. Everyone mm -hmm. wanted to be in it. Uh, every, every person on the bus to work was talking about their real estate investments. Right. And, and developers were throwing up buildings where, you know, 100% uh, financed and not pre-leased. <laughs> there, was, there was not a lot of discipline. Uh, so the company was growing, and I was given a lot of responsibility, and I, I learned a tremendous amount. Uh, for a number of years, mm. and then the the, the, the break slammed to a halt. <laughs> Just <laughs> the the entire world collapsed, where suddenly there was no financing available, and real estate was a bad word. Do you, do you remember so, like a Do you remember a day when that happened? When I, I, I actually remember a month. It was probably in it was probably mid to late 1990. Yeah, uh, and the banks. I think all of the bank CEOs called each other. And they said, we're way overexposed in real estate. We are, our, our loans are all non-performing. And we, ch we're, we turn off the tap. And it like, literally happened overnight. Wow. And so there I was. I was, I guess, 26 years old at the time. And I thought I was now the, the real estate developer. And there was nothing to develop. Great. So it was very, uh, suddenly it got very quiet very quickly. Mm. Um, at that point, uh, I had to kind of reinvent myself. I mean, there was still some property management going on, but it was less, certainly less exciting. Uh, and I always wanted to do an MBA. So I, uh, I chose to go do my MBA at, uh, in France at INSEAD. And uh, when I handed in my resignation, John Wiener said, well, let's talk. How about uh, I, 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 I sponsor your MBA? And uh, to the extent that I want you to come back, and if, if you don't, you're going to pay me back the money I spent on your MBA. But let's 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 work out a plan post MBA mm -hmm. where you where you you we join forces. Right. And so I had the brilliant idea. I said, you know, it's real estate is so bad in North America. I'm going to be going to France, and it's got to be better there. So <laughs> why don't I post MBA start up Canderel, France or Canderel oh, Europe? Yeah, <laughs> sure. So then, six months into my very MBA ambitious twenty-six-year-old. Yeah, yeah, seriously. Six, six months into my MBA program, I called him up and I said, "John, 
it's worse here. <laughs> I want to come home. <laughs> he said, well, there's nothing for you to do at home. <laughs> so those are some, uh, you know, definitely some, t some tough years, lean years. Uh, and so <laughs> then while, while doing my MBA, I was also, I had this kind of entrepreneurial bug. I wasn't interested in working for a, a, a large company. Mm. So I wrote a, uh, a, a business plan. Uh, which was in, through a ventures course, and it actually got uh, uh, good accolades and was uh, chosen as kind of the plan of the year amongst European business schools. And uh, and I'll tell you what it is. And so then I went to John Wiener and I said, "This is the plan. I want to do it. So forget real estate. Do you want to invest in my business?" Mm -hmm. And uh, well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you about the business, which seems very natural today. But remember, this is back in 1993, mm -hmm. where we didn't have you know, e-commerce, we didn't have the internet. Uh, and I had the, the, the idea, maybe 20 years ahead of my time, to that the, the, the home was going to be an important place of consumption. And I wanted to be the link between the merchants and the, the neighborhood commerce and the home with, uh, with a home delivery logistics system, with each delivery man being actually a franchisee named Nestor, which is like the butler from Tintin, mm -hmm. uh, who would deliver uh, items, pick up items, service the household, and uh, could come till 10 o'clock at night. Uh, seems, wow. Uh, you know, if I wrote that plan today, Very early. I could get yeah, a, a billion know. dollars in finance. Seriously. <laughs> Back in the day. So I, I launched that business with John's support in France. And uh, not only could I not raise money in France, it took me about four months just to open a bank account to deposit my money. Oh, my God. Because the French said, well, we don't do something like that here. People walk to the store. <laughs> I said, well, it's going to be something new. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, we launched the business, and it, it offered a whole range of services and uh, delivery concepts. But what turned out was the most popular uh, item and a real demand in the Parisian market was uh, dry cleaning and laundry. Mm -hmm. So if you can imagine the dry cleaners and laundries in, in, in Paris, they, they're closed Saturday and Sunday, mm -hmm. and then they open from 9 to 5. So if you, right. if if you, you have a job, if, if you, have a no, job you, you, yeah, you, you, you literally you can't, you can't pick up your dry cleaning. Yeah. So we had this service where you could, uh, uh, you could uh, get a one-hour time slot between 3 and 10 o'clock at night. Nestor would come along, pick up your clothes, and deliver them 48 hours later for the same price as you'd pay in the neighborhood store. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, we actually ran that, became the largest by volume dry cleaning company in Paris. I had subcontracted all of my, tr my trade to various dry cleaning industrial plants. Uh, t dry cleaning is a terrible, I hope I don't insult any dry cleaners, but dry cleaning is a terrible business. Because I clothes lose buttons, clothes have rips, clothes get worn, clothes have tears. Mm -hmm. And it's always the dry cleaner's fault. Mm -hmm. And so we had this massive onboarding of clients. It was mm -hmm. a very, very popular concept. But then we would, we would lose them just because of uh, quality issues that mm -hmm. are very, very hard to, to control. Um, and uh, so we, we finally decided to fully vertically integrate, uh, buy our own dry cleaning plant. Uh, somebody at one point approached me, a wine company approached me and said, you know, you're doing this delivery for dry cleaning. Would you like to deliver wine? We have a, and I said, well, no, that's stupid. We're a dry cleaning company. <laughs> how, how many years <laughs> in is this? It was seven years in, <clears throat> and so I was. Uh, my wife hates hates when I say this, but if I, if I had opened my eyes and perhaps made a trip to Silicon Valley, and looked what was happening in the world as opposed to being stuck into fixing my quality problem in dry cleaning, it would be a different story. Anyway, long story short, it wasn't a successful venture. Uh, John Wiener was a very uh, loyal and committed investor. Uh, we made money for the French government. The employees were happy. We we spent a lot, we, you know, capital investment, but it was not a successful uh, venture. Right. So that was the start. <laughs> wow, <laughs> interesting. Um, <laughs> so and, many more questions. Um, so yeah. so uh, post that, uh, because of the the business and then the start of. Kind of the uh, we'd be quite a lot of uh, visibility in in terms of uh, you know kind of the dot com of the 2000s. By then, I got hired by News International uh, to and I moved to London. I moved my family to London to uh, to essentially take their uh, e-commerce to develop e-commerce platforms for their brands. And so News International does uh, the Sun, 
the Sunday Times, the Times, uh, News of the World, right. and the, U the UK newspapers do a lot of selling off the page. So uh, collect coupons and you can buy pots and pans for 50% of the value. Things like, but, but they had solid, the Sunday Times Wine Club was the largest direct seller of wine in Europe. And the Sunday Times Book Club, I think, was at the time before Amazon, one of the biggest direct sellers of, of books. So they, there's a way to put that, anyway. Long story short, I did that for a number of years. Uh, and then uh, finally decided, you know, living in London, I said, what I want to do, I missed. I wanted to get back to Canada. Mm -hmm. Three kids were born in, in Europe. I wanted to get back to Canada and I wanted to get back to real estate. Yeah. So in 2000, end of 2001, we moved back to, to Canada. Nice. There was a, it was a long stint there. Yeah, seriously. No, no, it was, a, it was a great experience. I probably got my MBA too, you know, the second, second MBA. Anyway, so I came back, wanted to get back into real estate, and at that point I moved from the, uh, the developer side of the business to, uh, to the service side. And I was hired by CBRE. Uh, I had a relationship with Blake Hutchison uh, for a number of years. And in fact, my father was one of the founders of CBRE Canada. So I maintained that oh. relationship with the company and uh, opened uh, or took over the management of uh, CBRE's Montreal office. Wow. Uh, which was uh, struggling a little bit uh, back in 2002 uh, and managed to recruit, turn it around, and uh, today you know, it's the number one dominant firm in the, in the, in the marketplace. And in, in so doing, got more involved in CBRE management mm -hmm. and ran Eastern Canada for CBRE up until 2012. Mm -hmm. and, and what, like I almost, there's so much to dive into there. I so know, seriously. Um, I guess just to touch on that, like growing CBRE, obviously Collier's is, is a superior brokerage, but <laughs> <laughs> I haven't talked about JLL yet. Oh, yeah, 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 I know, I know. Um, but growing CBRE, so when I was talking with uh, Dan Holmes, who's one of the managing directors here, he said, oh, Brett, one, he's an extremely uh, proficient recruiter and he's really good at hiring impressive people. And like, so what, how did you grow the company? Like, what were some of the key, um, lessons you would um, I, I think I could speak like that. to that even perhaps better when I talk about the JLL story okay. so, so I, I left CBRE in 2012 yeah. and became the CEO of JLL and, Canada and always as a manager at CBRE always as a manager yeah. I've, I've never been a, a broker okay um, but um, so you, you know when you recruit you got to you can't just you can't you can't just recruit because somebody's a nice guy mm -hmm. you got to recruit to, to a specific function right and so uh, particularly at JLL, I, I, I segmented the platform and came up with a, a, a concept that I knew would be very appealing to brokers, which was to have a certain amount of uh, control over their, their business. Mm. Um, and, with a, and also a commitment to uh, not allow internal competition. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I kind of experimented with some of those ideas at CBRE by yeah. creating teams and seeing how teams function as opposed to the individual broker. Right. And then really rolled that out in a big way with JLL. Okay, and, so, um, so you were at CBRE till 2012, you said? Yeah. And yeah. then to JLL? In 2012. In 2012. Yeah. yeah. As the CEO. As the CEO. Okay. And, and at the time, uh, JLL had a very limited presence in Canada. Right. And it had been a bit, a bit of a, a checkered past, uh, principally because there were a lot of new initiatives at JLL globally, and Canada really never got a lot of attention or capital. And uh, it was always run by, you know, an American out mm -hmm. of Boston or Detroit who treated it as a side, as a, as a state, as opposed to a country where they didn't right. really understand the Canadian culture. Right. And so when, I, when, I, when JLL came knocking, we had long, lengthy conversations, and I actually wrote a very extensive business plan for JLL before I took the job. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, one, extremely competitive marketplace. Don't underestimate it. Extremely sophisticated marketplace. And it's no point just rolling out your banner and saying, join us. you got to have a new approach to the market. And so my approach was really something called the practice teams. So by business line and by geography, I would have teams that were fully integrated that ran their own profit center and the lead broker or the practice leader uh, essentially was a CEO of a small company mm. and had some compensation tied not only tied not only to his 
commissions, but to the performance of his business unit. Right. And so uh, that had great appeal to a number of, of brokers, typically the brokers who are hitting. For those who don't know, what is the traditional model? Because obviously we have a slightly different one at Collier's here. Uh, all firms vary. I, I would say uh, now team approaches are much more common. Back in 2001, they didn't exist. In 2012, I think we kind of perhaps led, JLL kind of led the charge in creating these team concepts. And so, you know, and, and that goes along with the sophistication of the brokerage industry today. The, the, a, a lone broker who, who, who works, you know, hides behind a, a closed door, works his own files, doesn't talk to anybody, tries to be master of all the skill sets required to do the A to Z of brokerage, uh, I think is a dinosaur. Right. He's, uh, he's, he's probably not a number one player. Well, no, he's not And regardless, <laughs> even if they're number one, they're letting their client down. Right. Because a client comes to a brokerage firm because they want exposure to market information and data and a variety of skill sets. Right. And so the, the old days of being a broker, going to the golf club, meeting your contact, then putting an offer, in a, that, that, that is just ancient history. Right. And so by uh, creating teams and particularly recruiting teams that had complementary skill sets, you don't need 10 people to knock down doors, make cold calls and shake the trees. Right. You need maybe one. And some very solid analysis, execution, yeah. follow through, marketing, social media presence, you know, it's a whole gamut. Mm -hmm. uh, that really looks to me more like a, a, a practice than a, a traditional brokerage. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, to answer, long winded way to answer your question, you know, how, how did I manage to recruit? Because I went to people with an appealing concept. Mm. And particularly brokers, I would say, who were getting to, who had a, a certain amount of success. But as they were looking forward, said, you know, how can I, how can I get to number one? And how, what is it going to take to kind of reinvent myself? And, and also a little bit, you know, successful brokers sometimes scratch their heads and say, you know, is there more to this? You know, I, yeah, I can, I've got this great revenue stream. I live well. But, you know, what's my legacy? What am I going right. to create? And so to, to embark them on a dream is very motivating, scary for a lot. Uh, and a number of them are not good managers. So, 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 yeah. so, so what we <laughs> no found out kidding. is interesting. So our, our first wave of hires at JLL uh, that were lead brokers and mm. practice leaders then became a second wave of team managers who were better, better at the, you know, making the, the, the ship sail properly and leaving the broker just to go out there and be the voice of the team in the marketplace. Mm. But... The teams. So you, I, so you have a team manager and a lead broker who's the face. A mix. Of it. Each team. There was no uh, prescribed methodology. Okay. Um, and so we let the teams kind of decide and, and and help them through that that process. I'm almost picturing like a Peter Sense, and then there's somebody behind who's actually doing yeah. stuff. Well, Peter Sense is 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 one of the rare who can do it all. Like he really he manages his team and he's out there very consistently with the. With the uh, with the with the clients, right. but behind him he's got specialists by sector. He's very well organized. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. We'll definitely just edit that part out. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, okay. Uh, well, one thing that I'm I'm always curious about. Um, you know, I know what I can say to clients if they ask me why Collier's is different, but being that you're on the landlord side now uh, and you deal with every brokerage. What do you see as the main differences? It's, it's interesting because you, it, it, you really get a different perspective. And uh, I think it, it really uh, starts with quality research. And the broker's ability to take that research out of the, the, the research department mm. and turn it into very valuable information for the client. And in fact, if I had to do it again, I would have spent more time with both CBRE and JLL showing brokers how to take that valuable research information and turn it into value add for clients. That, that is absolutely key. And then I would say, um, so that's, a, that's what I look towards as a, a, a differentiator. And then I would say the, the indi individual broker or brokerage team that has focus. You know, you, you cannot be... Uh, you know, jack of all trades, master of none. Right. What, what I would much rather talk to the specialist who sells apartment buildings in Etobicoke than 
the, the uh, investment broker who sells one day apartment buildings, the second day a retail mm -hmm. building, and the third day a farm field. Right. Right? Across all of the GTA. Right. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Still, still I am, I am interested. So, and, but do you see any sort of, just to hold you to a hard answer, do you see any sort of like hard, hard and fast uh, actual differences between the brokerages? Or are they all kind of, well, they're all brokers and the different teams are... Uh, I mean, there, there's right. some structural differences. I, I think uh, today scale is very important. Right. So uh, the firms that have a, I think it's very hard to be middle ground. So to have, be a, a fully integrated service firm at a global level is important. Mm. And that's not only the brokerage side, but that's also you know the facilities management, the project management, the, uh, the asset management with funds that the firms control. Um, and to be in every geography and really understand the flows of capital or the movement of tenants, mm -hmm. that's key. And that could only be played at a global level. Right. And then I think the boutique firms actually do add value because they're focused on a particular ge geography and it's really relationship driven and they get perhaps a little deeper than some of the large firms. Um, to be in the middle is very difficult because the middle have to type of, uh, they, they have to replicate the services of the large, but they don't have the economies of scale to do so. Right. No, no, that makes sense. Okay. Um, I have just a few more questions before we get into your actual business sure. today. Um, so, sorry. Um, selfishly, selfishly asked. Yeah. Selfishly all the about brokerage. the brokerage. He's yeah, just trying to seep out as much information as possible. Um, what, was, what was one of the craziest, what was the craziest day you can remember at JLL running that company? Wow. Hmm. I realize we've... Yeah, no, I'm just, I'm just thinking. Um, so we, we, there were some, you know, certainly very exciting days. Mm. I mean, if you're looking for a kind of joke story, I'm not sure it comes to the top of mind, but right. there were some very exciting days. Uh, we went through uh, five acquisitions. So an acquisition, uh, we bought a number of property management firms. We bought a brokerage firm. Uh, they're complicated. Mm. Uh, I like the negotiations. It's nice to get over the finish line and then do the integration of the team. That's fun. And for me, when I did land big, big brokers, managed to recruit big names, that was always, you know, like, hey, I accomplished something today. Right. So that was, that was fun. Uh, in terms of some of the stories, uh, you know, it was very hard in the early days as JLL to kind of turn up at the party and uh, we didn't really have credibility. We didn't right. have the critical mass. Uh, mm -hmm. The company when I joined was including all of the facilities and property management groups, project management groups, was about 150 people. Mm -hmm. It grew to about 1,500 people. And we were really, people knew of the brand at an international level, but didn't really know or even respect the, there was even a negative connotation in the, in the Toronto marketplace. And so I, I remember we, we had to, uh, we went to the ICSC and uh, I wanted to make a little bit of a splash. JLL's arrived. And so I thought, okay, all of the other brokerage firms have the, the whole cock cocktail circuit booked. Right. Sunday night booked, yeah. uh, après skis booked, uh, you know, uh, Monday nights booked. And so how are we going to fit in and then draw off the 800 people that go to the, the Collier's l launch event or yeah. the 500 people that go to the Cushman party at uh, Earl's, et cetera. Right. And so I thought, okay, what we'll do is we're going to, it's always a pain to get from the Vancouver airport and uh, get to Whistler. So we're gonna rent a number of uh, party buses. So we'll pick people up when they arrive from their Toronto or Montreal flight on the Sunday afternoon. And then Perfect. we'll have them for two hours while we drive them up to Whistler and have our cocktail party in the bus. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> That's a brilliant idea. So <laughs> we, we, we launched that idea and I thought, okay, reserve six buses. Well, then the team said, well, I don't think we need six, uh, maybe three. Okay, three. Then a few days before, they said, yeah, maybe two. Mm -hmm. And then they said, okay, we really only need one bus. I said, oh, that's a bit unfortunate. I really wanted to create a splash. Okay, one bus. So we had about uh, a dozen JLL people on the bus, and two clients turned up. Oh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> that, and that client felt very special. Very special. <laughs> 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 Uh, everything you wanted. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyways, over 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 time, it uh, 
it uh, it got uh, re you know the reputation built, the volume right. built, and uh, today I think if they held a party, it would be oversold. Right. It's just right. speaking. Hundred buses. Yeah, hundred buses. Yeah, I don't know if you could do a hundred, but you spoke a bit to the fact that sort of JL had a bit of a checkered past with Canada specifically because of sort of the ups and downs that it's you know being played off as a state versus an actual country. How hard was it to like? Rechange your reputation to the marketplace. Uh, it was hard. I mean, it was. Yeah, but that's just. Uh, it, it was uh, walking my the the soles off my shoes. So mm -hmm. I, I I I met with probably every you know middle to high level broker in town. Sat down with them. Explained the new process. I think everyone was intrigued because JL has a great reputation internationally, mm -hmm. and I think. Perhaps because of, uh, you know, I'd run a successful operation before, there was a certain credibility when I said, uh, you know, I have the capital, mm -hmm. I've committed my career to it, I'm 100% backed by uh, the U.S., um, and to prove that, you know, this is, this is what we're doing, we're renting new office space, we're rolling out the brand, and I, I also had a wallet, I had, I had checks to pay right. brokers to right. incentivize Signing them bonus. to come over. Yeah. 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 Hmm. No, brokers can't be bought. No, <laughs> they can't be bought at all. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, okay, so... Um, so I, sir, just tie the circle, you went from JLL and then you went to right back to Candorel. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, that, yeah, 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 came all the way back to Candorel. Uh, so I'd been at uh, JLL for six years. Yeah. I was very pleased with what I had accomplished, and I would say also that um, that uh, you know, the, the CEO should change over time mm -hmm. as the needs of a company changes. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I was definitely there as a as a as a, an agent of change and 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 to to push growth. Right. I, I, I love that, that kind of startup entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial uh, opportunity. Uh, today it's a very it's a, an established business. And so I think it's much more about uh, you know uh, turning the screws and tightening the the operations so it's a bit more of a well-oiled machine. Mm -hmm. And I would say something that I n never really had a chance to do is is uh, heavy business development from the f Alan McKenzie, the, the now mm -hmm. CEO, to go out and meet the clients and be uh, directly in the deal flow yep. and support brokers. And um, so. Right time, right change, and I think the company will continue to do very well. Yeah. Um, so I, I uh, over the years, had maintained a very good relationship with uh, Jonathan Weiner. Uh, besides the fact that he says I took him to the cleaners, <laughs> <laughs> literally, <laughs> the, the laundry expression, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so we've uh, we'd always uh, kind of danced with each other as to sometimes I wanted to go back, sometimes mm. he wanted me to come back, mm. and we had conversations over the years. And then finally, he called me in the summer of 2018. And he said, "You know, I'm 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 at the later stages of my career. I'm 69 years old. Uh, the the day to day is not the stress that I want to have. Uh, you know, obviously, I I want to keep a finger in the company because I'm its capital, and I have I feel value to add in terms of some of the decision making. But I I want to I want to hand it over to somebody." And so I, I thought that was it was a, it's a lovely story to to come come back to where I started. Um, it's nice to go back to the to the development side. I get to, right. to touch real estate and be very involved in the development and service side, you know, pro, you know, property and project management side again. And uh, so I was happy to make that move. Awesome. So, so given <clears throat> the fact that you have this entrepreneurial spirit, does that say something to Candorel in the sense that you guys are going to be potentially, you know? reshaping things based on sort of your approach to doing business, potentially going to France or Europe? Oh, maybe. I d you're just giving me an idea. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, uh, yes. Yeah, so I think if, if anyone I'll had, uh, if, if anyone had uh, followed my past, they, 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 uh, I think they would recognize that I'm not just going to stand still. Uh, I'm very ambitious for the, the business. I, I, I think there's a huge opportunity for it. I, otherwise, I wouldn't have jumped on board. Um, but in order to take advantage of those opportunities, which I'll, uh, I'll talk about in a second, um, it, it's, it certainly needs to be you know, restructured. Mm -hmm. And so that's uh, essentially what I've been doing for the last uh, eight months. 
Can, can you, um, before we talk a little bit about that restructuring and what you guys, the exciting stuff that you guys are doing, um, can you give a little background on what Canderell is up to right now? You know, how big are you guys? What exciting projects do you have on the move? Sure. Um, so Canderell uh, has 400 employees, uh, active in the six major cities across Canada, Montreal, Ottawa, Toronto, Edmonton, Calgary, and Vancouver, uh, headquartered in Montreal. Uh, but with uh, almost equal weighting uh, across the country. Mm. And um, it, uh, it currently has a, a, a management platform of its, its own assets and third-party management of in excess of 20 million square feet of office space. Uh, and then in the development pipeline is probably in the range of six to seven billion dollars. Uh, principally active in uh, office acquisition or development mm -hmm. and then uh, multi-res uh, condo or purpose-built right um, our largest project just to name a few would be something we call Taza which is a joint venture with the first the Tusina First Nations of Calgary based in Calgary so if you look at a map of Calgary there's a slice missing out of the cheese uh, that has never been developed right and uh, that is owned by the Tusina Nation it's the reserve and the uh, provincial government of Alberta came in and had to create a, or wanted to create a ring road around, the full ring road around Alberta, uh, uh, around uh, Calgary, uh, purchased the rights from the nation, and in so doing, created a number of cloverleaf exits from that ring road uh, through mm -hmm. the nation, which were fabulous development sites right. for mixed, uh, mixed use, uh, retail, yeah. office industrial, etc. And so uh, the Tucina Nation went to the marketplace and to, to for a, a joint venture partner. And we've been involved in this project for uh, about four years now. Uh, it's, a, it, it's really, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a groundbreaking type of project in terms of the relationship we have with the nation. We are really working closely with them to, to create wealth in the community right. uh, with a very long perspective. And uh, the, the, the chief said to me, we, we, don't, we don't think about returns like you think about returns. What's mm. important for me is five generations from now. And so it's an interesting message, mm -hmm. and we we, yeah. we, 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 we yeah. adapt to it. But it's about a thousand, a quarterly approach. A, 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 thousand, right. a thousand acres of development. Uh, wow. And it's, it's it's one of the largest projects in Canada. So that's that's one. Um, a thousand acres that you guys are developing. Yes, that's insane. <clears throat> that's, that's a lot of space. Yeah, I'm it's thinking a lot about of space. So it's in three villages. Yeah, three zones. Uh, the first one is already kicked off with a, a Costco that'll open in uh, spring next year, mm -hmm. and uh, a 250,000 square foot shopping center that we're about to launch. And then the uh, there's a there's a, there's a, the other the other two are well advanced and we'll have announcements coming out shortly. Okay, holy smokes! For for reference for those listening, if you've heard of the East Harbor project, that was the first episode that we shot was about East Harbor, the okay. first golf site, um, or now um, Cadillac Fairview site. Yeah, but that is yeah. Like d everybody throws different numbers about what's actually going to be developed, but it's roughly forty acres there. And so you're talking about so a thousand a thousand acres. acres is a large yeah. project. Yeah. And it's a, a massive infrastructure project just to get the project going. Right. Uh, water filtration, yeah, treatment services, plants, services. Everything. And it goes all the way down to working with the nation to create a, 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 an urban planning department, uh, to create a, a municipal taxation policy, um, to create a collection process, to, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very extensive in terms of the relationship. Right. Um, so that's one. Uh, another would be uh, our project at uh, Lakeshore and Bathurst. So we, if you recall, there's a, that's, an old that's Rogers right. facility. Yeah. So yeah. We, we purchased that piece of land. You, you live in the building? Yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's, a, it's a homeless shelter. Yeah. Now, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So no, that's no, appropriate. Live, he lives across the street. Yeah. Um, so that's a, uh, a large mixed use, principally uh, residential project. Yeah. So we're in planning phase for that. Yeah. Uh, we're also in planning phase for our headquarters in Toronto, which is 1075 Bay Street, which is a 12-story office building, which uh, we feel that uh, the, the numbers certainly work to, to pull that building down, to rebuild 200,000 square feet of mm -hmm. office, and mm -hmm. go up 66 stories for 
condo. Wow, awesome. Yeah, and, and a bl- you know, Blur and Bay address. Yeah. Um, in Montreal, we, we have... 66 a, stories is getting to be more regular, yes, which is no. a huge, <laughs> you know... Yeah. Big yeah, building. It's huge. Yeah. Yeah. Especially in that little quadrant. You got the one there. Yeah. First golfs is already up. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, uh, we just closed on a project uh, last Friday, uh, yeah. a partnership with LaSalle, BVK, and North American Development, which is the purchase of the Edmonton City Center. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, had to onboard uh, 60 staff that work in that center to our property management company. Okay. Uh, so where so where would most of your time be spent? Is it searching for new development opportunities? Is it negotiating with you know First Nation partners? Uh, personally, and- it's uh, it's um, it's really about the people, right? It's uh, I'm a big believer in, in in building a team, managing a team, and, and mm. delegating to the team. Mm. And so I'm I'm through that process. I've restructured the organization of the company. Uh, by I, I like the idea of, of small teams that have a certain amount of autonomy and, and you know delegate responsibility to them. Mm-hmm. So what we've done is we've created uh, a number of uh, profit centers. We have uh, our, our property management group, our project and development group, uh, and our marketing sales group for condos. And they are expected to be uh, independent entities that will work for Canderell, but also work with third parties. And they have a business plan, a go-to-market strategy, a team, and we support their development. Right. And then on I'm seeing the, a trend here. On the, yep. in, on the investment <laughs> side, we have uh, an investment team by geography. Uh, so we have six across the country. Right. And they're tasked with uh, working toward very particular investment theses that they will continually evolve if they work or don't work. And then uh, to you know place Candrell's capital, but I forgot to mention there's a big shift in Candrell's orientation, um, which is the biggest change that we're just adjusting to, mm-hmm. which is for its 45 year history, Candrell has been, I would say, a very entrepreneurial, uh, opportunistic developer that was focused for the most part on its own capital, how to maximize our own capital, and what's happened over the years is that projects have become so big. Everything we do, 100% of what we do, is uh, in partnerships mm-hmm. with either landowners like the First Nations group or financial partners. And so when I arrived, I said to everyone at Candra, I said, so, so who's our customer? Doesn't a business need a customer? Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, we don't have a customer. We work for ourselves. Right. Oh, <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe it's the uh, office tenant. I said, well, yeah, I think the office tenant's a customer of the building. I'm not sure they're an enterprise customer. Okay, the condo buyer. No, they, well, I think they buy a condo. I don't know if they really have a long-term relationship with Candrell. Mm-hmm. I said, our customers are our institutional partners. Mm-hmm. And so the shift in the business is really we are a service organization. We service institutional capital to uh, buy, manage, and build real estate Hmm. with the ability, and in fact, the preference to co-invest with them, which achieves alignment, Mm -hmm. but not not, not a necessity. So we get hired to do property management. We we, we do that as a third party, for third parties. But our preference is to invest. And so once you've said that, and I went and visited all the institutional partners across the country, they said, we love Candrell, and in fact, we need Candrell because in order to achieve superior returns, we need to get into development, and there are very few national developers that, with whom we can partner across the country. Mm-hmm. So that was one message, good message. Yeah, yeah. And the other message they said is so. If Especially you re- in Quebec. So they said they said to us, well, if you do want to play with us, and we encourage you to. Uh, you need to be able to talk the institutional language, which means take a look at your platform and how can you make it more robust? Hmm. Uh, Reporting, uh, sustainability, uh, technology, who would succession plans? Who would be some of these institutional partners? Um, uh, LaSalle, we just did a deal with, uh, Fiera, Kingset, uh, Hoop, uh, op trust. Okay. The list goes on. There's about right. a dozen. Yeah. Uh, some family offices, mm-hmm. private wealth, 
uh, we're involved with Claridge, uh, with, uh, with the Bronfman family office. Mm. Um, you know, well-capitalized groups, but that, that require a certain level of, of, of partnering. Right. And so I went back to Candrell and I said, well, that's a great challenge to us. I said, if we can, we can rise to that challenge, I've just heard a buy message from all of the major institutions across the country. And so we've been on a process of restructuring the business, as I just explained. Yeah. So making some of the entity stand on its on their own. Two, making sure that we just don't chase after deals in a haphazard manner. So every investment team is working toward thesis and investment. And then on the back end, heavy lifting, n not so much fun. Mm -hmm. But uh, our technology platform, our accounting department, and uh, all sorts of things, and we've made we've made significant strides. We changed our brand, we modernized it, changed our website. It's much simpler, easier to understand. It, 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 it talks to this message, mm -hmm. and so that's that's what's kept me busy, uh, kind of positioning Canrail for the next step, and that's Canada. <laughs> and maybe maybe France and maybe the U.S. Yeah. and who knows the yeah. the ambition is high. If you'd yeah. like to make an announcement, Brett, we have a bunch <laughs> of listeners right premature, now. Premature, premature. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. so China, yeah. China. Whoa, <laughs> yeah. that would be unexpected. <laughs> yeah. Um, you have a lot of obvious service lines um, from property management to investment to development. Where do you see the the greatest opportunity? Like, where do you see like you guys making the most money? in what market as much detail as that you'd like to get i haven't figured that out uh mm -hmm. you know so it, it is extremely competitive out there mm -hmm. um and sometimes uh it's better to do nothing and so that's why i pushed and this was even before i hired i said to john i said so what happens if the development you know tap gets turned off mm -hmm. i don't want to be the guy to come in and have to fire 200 people and so that's why I've made this push to develop our third-party revenues. And so, um, you know, particularly on the kind of project and development side, the, we, we, we really, we can, what we can bring to our clients is the thinking of an entrepreneurial developer and execute on their behalf. And so as an example, we're building uh, Giant Tiger's headquarters in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, corporate user. And uh, we've often seen corporate users make mistakes because they build to their need as opposed to what the market need for, should be for a building. And then they build a white elephant that in 20 years doesn't have a use. So we've really been there at the table to guide them through that process, the feasibility, pulling all of the, uh, the um, professionals together, and then r running and bidding, you know, bidding out the, job, uh, the general contracts and, and running it as their eyes and ears, but purely as a fee business. Um, and, and, and though the brokerage firms, the JLs, or the Colliers do a lot of project management work, mm. for the most part, it's for the corporations, for the users, tied with facilities management and such, or tenant build-outs. There's not a lot for the, uh, the, the I guess, the, called the non-sophisticated investor who's right. looking for a way to create value on their projects. Mm -hmm. And so I would say where the, there's a real opportunity that we're going to push on is that and you must come across this all the time. You call somebody who's owned a building for 30 years and they say, well, I don't want to sell. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> no, sorry, never. you have so much upside <laughs> on your building. You have some underdeveloped density. And no, yeah. I don't want the tax issues and yeah. capital gains. Well, now you can say to them, well, would you, would you be interested in joint venturing with a developer mm. where you recognize the value of your asset but get to participate in the upside and they can do that either on a fee basis if you don't want them touching your equity. Right. You know, I haven't heard of that. Source financing for you, put it all yeah. together. Yeah. Or put their equity in and be you know, truly aligned as a partner. And so I'd say that... Uh, David has a new sales pitch. <coughs> I, I have said something like that before, not on the well, fee-only so, side. Uh, the interview. Yeah. Okay. Um, back to the interview. <laughs> yeah, back, back. We're back and we're back after these messages. Um, one thing um, I've I've heard from a few people that you're very uh, into technology and you're you're a big prop tech guy at JLL. Um, I don't know if I'm, I'm getting these messages mixed, but there's some sort of Blackhawk program. Is that does that sound right? Blackbird. Uh, Blackbird. Bla yeah, uh, Blackbird was this kind of uh, way to uh, visualize through an interactive map all of the data that came out of the research function. Okay. Was it was that is that something that I didn't invent it. It came out of a, a jail at Atlanta, mm -hmm. but I think the uh, 
the Toronto office and maybe Canadian offices of JLL were the biggest adopters. Ah. Like it really became very much part of their sales pitch. Okay. Um, what's some of the what's some of the interesting prop tech or like technology? Oh, that yeah, don't get me going. So <laughs> um, so first of all, Can Canrel uh, is a limited partner in a fund called Fifth Wall, which is uh, I just came back from their uh, LP conference in uh, LA. So uh, Fifth Wall's um, uh, kind of go to market strategy. They're a venture capitalist, only focus on the prop tech sector, but all of their LPs are owners, managers, developers of real estate. Mm. And what they do is they validate the startup solution with the LPs. Right. And then the LPs are the first adopters of the programs. And because the LPs are some of the largest landlords across North America, they immediately get uh, customer market base. dominance. Val yeah. 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 And so a good example of that is VTS. So VTS has just now become kind of the, the uh, predominant uh, uh, leasing management marketing program by by landlords was an original uh, fifth wall uh, funded project. Okay. So what's happening in the world of prop tech? Frustration for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Um, and I and and hopefully somebody listening to this podcast can give me an answer to this. Yeah. So the the uh, on the ownership side, uh, the, uh, the 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 real estate companies tend to be very siloed and they're siloed around their functions so there's finance there's the acquisition team there's property management there's construction yeah there's accounting there's property you know etc and information does not flow across the organization and so PropTech comes along with brilliant solutions but they're siloed solutions. Mm. So I could, I could buy Honest Buildings, fabulous program to help manage the construction spend on a large project. But it wasn't designed as an integrated solution across all the mm. platform. My nirvana is that every piece of information that comes into our company is either transferred to us or entered once, mm and never touched again. That is entirely impossible today for any company in real estate. So why has the prop tech industry not responded? Now, there's some, you know, Yardi, MRI have made good advances. Uh, Yardi, somewhat a, a, a closed architecture. MRI is a bit more open, but they don't do every component well, so we're still looking at piecing to the, the other parts with it. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's frustrating. It's very, very hard for, you know, we're a small 400 person company, not specialist in technology, to do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. But I'm very focused on the sector. Yeah. Yeah. I came sure. across the one, one, I'll, I'll give them free publicity, uh, which I'm most excited about, called uh, Brainbox AI. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Montreal startup. You know, you heard of it? No. Okay, so Brainbox AI is um, AI management of HVAC systems. Okay. So all they need is a connected connection to the, 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 the building management system. Oh. Okay, yeah. And then okay. the AI will learn the HVAC functions over a period of six to eight weeks and then bring external data, principally you know, weather data, but you know you can also integrate uh, you know movement of population in the building and mm -hmm. such into into it uh, use of boardrooms and such, and then it starts predictively managing the need to heat or cool. Ah. So on a hot day, for example, uh, it knows that you know on the on the uh, west side of the building come uh, three o'clock, it's it's better to start cooling as of two because the sun's going to hit. Right. But then it also knows, live, mm -hmm. that a, a, a big storm cloud is passing over at 3 o'clock. Well, it's going to block the sun, so no need to cool. Right. And so what they say, and I have not proven this out, is they can drive 25% savings in energy consumption in buildings, yeah, which wow. is huge. huge. Wow. In addition to making people happier. Comfort to level. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Right. Comfort Comfort productivity. Yeah. yeah. 
everything. That, that, that's a, for me, that's a, that's a game changer, particularly when you think that uh, it's the, the built environment that actually contributes the most to CO2 emissions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I did not know that. Mm-hmm. Um, Collier's has a, is partners with Techstars to yeah. do some acceleration yeah. Yeah. programs, so it's yeah. kind of a similar concept. Yeah. Um, really interesting stuff. Is there, is there anything, um, one, one thing I was curious about is, um, is there any major um, difference between how things are operating in Toronto and how they're operating in Montreal? I'm just trying to, you know, you're, you're largely in that area. I am um, operating. I mean, I think the, 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 the real estate decisions are made in a similar vein. Yeah. Like, you know, you're, you're looking at numbers and IRRs and return on yeah. capital. Um, you know, I, I think for many years, uh, investors outside of Quebec kind of put a Quebec factor yeah. uh, with a bit of concern as to, you know, how, how, you know ability to execute I- in Quebec and, you know, maybe even the political risks going back 20 years. Um, I think that's lar- largely dissipated mm-hmm. with the performance of Quebec real estate and the performance of the Montreal economy. Right. Um, you know, there's certainly very different uh, economic drivers for all of the major cities across Canada. Very, very different. Yeah. The way we look at you know, an asset in, in Calgary and predict demand is very different from Toronto or, or Vancouver. Um, and I would say the, the, the thing that is a common problem across the board, but dealt with in a very different manner, is uh, getting through the entitlement zoning phase uh, in every city. Right. <clears throat> completely different. Com- completely different in terms of the way uh, the, uh, the city halls work and the various processes to go through mm-hmm. you know in in, in in Ontario at least you have a secondary board that you can petition if you're not you're not you don't know, manage to get the results at the city level yeah that doesn't exist in other provinces some cities are much more sensitive to community issues others to you know park tax to development charges to the new uh, REM charges in Montreal mm-hmm. and it has become the uh, the, the, the trickiest the phase of, uh, of a project for any developer. Mm. Very, very unpredictable. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Just being conscious of your time. Yeah. It is like oh, yeah. five. Okay. Oh, my God. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. <what>? Sorry <laughs> so about let's that. go for another five minutes. And okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. I, I don't know. I talk, I, how could I talk so much? <laughs> well, you have a wonderful yeah. history. Yeah. yeah. Dry cleaning to, well, Candrell, like dry cleaning to, you know, <clears throat> yeah. back to Candrell. Do you have a question? So I see a question here, and I'd really like to know, uh, what were some of the major changes you saw within the industry in the last five years, and what should one expect in the coming five years? Very good question. Um, So, yeah, it it is changing a lot, um, and I think it's becoming much more, uh, the developers or owners have to be much more broad in their outlook. It's not just about the, the numbers and the, the, the returns. So I'll tell you what keeps me up at night. Uh, I'm worried about how to fix an issue of uh, homelessness in one of our projects because uh, you know, people are sleeping inside the mall and on the streets and you can't just give them a kick in the butt and tell them to leave. Mm-hmm. Uh, Is that the Lakeshore Bathurst one? No. Okay. (laughs) Uh, What keeps me up at night is um, we are uh, doing a development where there is an uh, artistic community that is going to, through gentrification, no longer afford the rents. And so how to find a reasonable way to accommodate their needs, maybe within the building or outside the building. Uh, And once again, just can't say get lost, it's your problem. Uh, you know, to the the prop tech issues we're talking about. So it's it's become it's really become m- more holistic. I find it was uh, it was simpler before. You know, you you buy a piece of dirt, you pretty much know what was happening on the the zoning side, and you were in construction before you could mm-hmm. you could blink. Uh, it's become very complex. Hmm. You'd certainly get ar- along with uh, Greg Lintern. Chief yeah, city okay. planner. He, yeah. he has great care for that. Yeah. Those yeah. issues. Yeah. Those are. Um, do you want to do the last? But I, you know, I go. It, it, it is healthy. Mm-hmm. Like it. Um, it. Uh, I. I think there. I think developers now have come to the point where they realize the impact of development on a community, 
and there's an interest in accommodating all of the stakeholders. I think it has to be that way. And particularly, I would say your generation is much more sensitive to that and making sure the company is doing the right thing than the, the days of the past. Right. Uh, okay. This is the final question. Yes. Final one. Uh, so it's called the three truths. So years from now, uh, you live a long and successful life and you go to be very old and very happy with, uh, with your family and friends and you accomplish everything that you ever wanted to. Uh, but it's your last day and for whatever reason every article that you've written every interview that you've ever done has been erased um, and you only have three short notes to write on a piece of paper to pass on to your family and friends and the people who love you what would you put on those notes Wow. <laughs> um, so uh, one I would say is investing in your relationships uh, you know, your, 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 your family to start off with but then uh, the, um, it's very easy as we move in our careers to forget people along the way. Mm -hmm. And the people that you appreciated who helped you learn uh, are, are typically feel vested in your career and don't neglect to go back to them, treat them as mentors and stay close to them. They appreciate it and you get a lot out of it. Uh, so that's one. Um, I would say um, two is um, be audacious. Like it, it, it and I, I mean, I'm not. I don't want to generalize, but I, I find that in in your generation, that people want to go methodically through their career. Okay, I'm at this. I'm an analyst. Now I'm a senior analyst. Now I'm a developer, and. You know, you, you, you don't have to go through all of the steps to get to your ultimate goal, mm. right? You know, dream big and, and, and go for it immediately because it's amazing how you kind of can settle and the years go by so fast that suddenly you're, you're 50 years old and you thought, okay, now I have to make my move. Now is, now is when I right. make and a move. And then it's too know, late you or you're in a habit. Name. Well, yeah. why didn't you do that when you were 25? Right. And so you have youth on your side, and you know have faith that you will, uh, that you can succeed. You don't, you know, you can always go to people with experience, surround yourself with the experience, but don't hold yourself back. And I can't come up with a third. Um, I, I, I guess another thing for me that's uh, you know been very important is a balanced lifestyle. Mm. Uh, I've always been uh, heavily into you know competitive sports. Like what? Uh, you know, early days, uh, triathlons. My body's suffering for it now, but I'm always training for some kind of event or marathon or, or uh, whatever, hike or trip or a cycling mm. race. Um, and then also, even beyond that, you know, just uh, you know, you know, uh, try to uh, enrich your brain, learn another language, uh, be in the arts, uh, give back to society. It's not just about work. Awesome. That's well said. Great advice. Yeah. Thanks so much. Okay. Thanks for your time. Gee. <laughs> I was on the hot seat for the last week. <laughs>